there was a fire in the restaurant and this happened like two and a half months after we opened and by this time we had no traction like the numbers were still like the number of people we were serving a month would have been like 500 to 600 customers a month this did turn into like a source of like stress you know like stress meaning like you're sort of like wondering you know we made this investment like what have we done you know was this a the right thing to do at six in the morning one of my employees showed up at at our door and rang the bell covered in like suit and he's like i've just come from the restaurant everything is like burnt down Welcome to Millionaire Mondays, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that built them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, how Candace Locke, Samir Mirchandani, and Amit Mirchandani brought authentic handmade Mexican food to Bengaluru for the first time and turned it into a profitable bootstrapped restaurant chain called Chinita. Candice Locke grew up in Petaling Jaya, Malaysia, in a Cantonese family. But years later, while she was working in tech in New York, the Latinos at the Copacabana Salsa Club just called her Chinita. Chinita is an endearing Spanish way of saying little Chinese girl. And Candice couldn't help but fall in love with the food of these Latinos, Latin American food broadly, but also Mexican food more specifically. And Candice brought this passion for Mexican food, along with her nickname, with her when she came to India. She was posted in Bengaluru for work in 2008, and while she was trying to figure out how to navigate life in India, she met Amit Mirchandani. Professionally, Amit was living and working in the United States, but his parents were based in Bengaluru, and so he was in town on a family trip when he met Candice and they started dating. Fast forward to 2010, and Candice had fully moved to India. She and Amit got married and had their first child, but she never forgot her passion for Mexican food from her days back in New York. Amit and his brother Samir, who had both spent time working in San Francisco, also had a love for the same, having visited Mexican restaurants in Mission District regularly during the their time there. And so this trio decided to get together and start making Mexican food, specifically tacos, for sale at Bengaluru's Sol Sante. So when we decided to do the Sol Sante flea market, it was really more for fun. Like at least for me, it was for fun. It was a, a way for me to kind of put the product out there, want to see if uh, India or Bangalore is ready for a real Mexican food. Because up until then, I think Taco Bell just came into the market. And uh, the only way you can get nachos is if you go to the cinema and you order, you know, nacho chips, uh, which is not really nachos. And um, yeah, so it was a way to kind of test the market. Uh, but more than anything, I didn't think anything further than that. I just wanted to get the food out there. And uh, to my surprise, it was a huge hit. Yeah, it seems like it was a resounding success to yeah. the point where, how often does Sol Sante happen? Is it a weekly thing? No, I think hmm. back then it was like every two months. No, no, every... Every month? Three or four months, I yeah. think. Okay. Maybe two or three a year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so were you kind of like, did you guys go back right away as soon as you had the chance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I should also mention that uh, everything was made out of my mother-in-law's uh, kitchen. And um, so, and it's made from scratch. So it was three days of hard work putting together and then um, in that small little kitchen. And uh, uh, yeah, just, just for the sake of having a good time, basically. And um, yeah, so every three months it would happen and then people would start asking, uh, where do we uh, get more of this food? That's when Samir and I decided that we'll do more catering and from small scales to like eventually like catering to bigger and bigger parties. Was this, were you guys, the, this kitchen and, and uh, your parents' house, yeah. is that in Indranagar? Yeah. Okay. It's next to 80 feet road. And, yeah. But basically she lived there and it was my parents' kitchen that used yeah. to get taken over for days in. at a time. Yeah. Oh my With, gosh. Yeah. It's a, there's so many components to make, right? It's like, even if you just want to make tacos, you have to make the tortillas from scratch, beans, salsa, chicken, the, the meat fillings. Yeah. Uh, oh, we should mention that. Uh, this is also around the time when I got pregnant, got married, got pregnant. So I couldn't do everything myself. So we uh, invited a lot of our friends to come and join us. And, and people love it. People love to kind of, you know, make food that people want to eat and, you know, and see the excitement in people's faces. Am I missing something? What else? <laughs> um, no, I, I think I think Samir, you were probably seeing all this unfold. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know, not as a bystander, but kind of like probably you know, you're you're a bit like, whoa, what is going on? Like this is crazy. Should I tell you the story from my perspective about yeah, Candice? Sure, sure. I'd love okay. to hear it. So basically, I had a travel startup 
so I moved back in 2009 and I had like I just knew I wanted to leave corporate and get into uh, business right I wanted to take control of my own life basically so I had a travel startup for two years and then it was kind of uh, running along and a lot of decisions whether to pivot not pivot keep it going not keep it going I mean but that's just the str struggles of like startup world right so she started doing this out of my parents house and we all lived in the US for about 10 years each so that's where the love for Mex like authentic Mexican actually grew for her in New York and for Amit and me in San Francisco because uh, there was there's an area called the Mission that has like all the Mexicans uh, running Mexican restaurants for the community right so there was a taco truck there, but that was like, again, they don't even speak English. And, you know, we just love that place. I mean, it was so magical for us. She studied Mexican food at a place called the Institute of Culinary Education what in New York. What classes there? I mean, so obviously this inclination towards Mexican food was there. Then we were, you know, when we moved back and said that this is the cuisine we miss the most, can you make it for us at home? And we were pushing her. That part was definitely, you know, and we were her guinea pigs. And so she did make, like, she started off by probably making, like, pork tacos at home or something right yeah it was pork tacos it was bean tacos yeah and then um like i said it was there was nothing nothing in bangalore at that time not even yeah. nature's basket so it was um you know making corn tortilla from scratch uh making my own sour cream uh trying to get to the flavors as close as i can remember how it is in the u.s yeah and um and then you know uh when when I visited Amit, so Amit used to live in San Francisco. So when I visited him a couple of times, we went to this place called Papalote in Mission as well, run by um, a Mexican family, this restaurant, and they have the best salsa. And that is what inspired our salsa today, which is yeah. what's being served today. Yeah, our roasted tomato salsa. Yeah, yeah. The roasted tomato salsa, yeah. So when we had the soul sante i should talk about chinita the name so it's um, this is something that i think is really interesting because a lot of startups they go through brand pivots or yeah. name pivots right especially the name that people typically choose at the beginning of their business it's not great right yeah. and they just come up with something off the top of their head and then later on they realize that oh yeah there's this reason why it doesn't work or that reason why it doesn't work but chinita has actually been there from the beginning Correct. and i think even before the beginning right there's an origin story to this name yeah. Yeah. and also the design of the logo as well i'm curious yeah. because even on those early flea market stands that you guys set up it's yeah. the same logo yes. that you guys have today so <laughs> yeah. tell me the story of chinita so um when we we decided to uh get on the soul sante flea market um we needed a brand name right and you needed to put like a signboard up and um uh so and and we were i mean i was thinking like what name should we put up there and i was like you know what when i was in new york we i used to go salsa dancing a lot and um at the clubs they used to call me chinita right the puerto ricans the mexicans they would call me chinita and uh so i thought it was funny that uh Chinese girl, Ch Chinita means Chinese girl, right? Chinese girl would to come to India and make Mexican food. And uh, so the name, the name just stuck, right? So Chinita was there. And Amit's a designer. He runs a design company called Lucid Design. Um, and uh, he uh, was looking up ways to kind of make Chinita the logo look cool. And uh, he found this uh, uh, design of, uh, I think, 19... He's going to kill me. 1986 Olympics in Mexico, where the design had these lines around it. And uh, he, and he was like, oh, cool. Let me put those lines around Chinita. So the original Chinita logo, it's the same font, but it had these lines around it to kind of resemble the, the logo that was in the Olympics uh, in, in Mexico. But over time, just because um, no one could get it right, the lines and the, and, you know, the... Um, the spacing and everything so we removed a few lines into one bold line so but that logo and that name and that branding um was you know it works until date and like people recognize it and people remember names so um so we we stuck with it yeah, yeah. chinita was the perfect name given like you know the story stemming from candace which is like you know just completely like unique and i mean she literally Moved. She was an engineer with Yahoo. She, software. She engineer. was a software engineer. No, no, software engineer. Yeah. Well, product manager. Product manager. Yahoo. Then yeah. she moved to India, met Amit, moved back to the US with no intention of moving here. Had her own like, Just like you know, him. wake up, you know, crisis and you know that uh, pivotal like <laughs> moment where you have to make like key decisions and took a leap of faith, moved to India, 
started dating my brother married him and then this business stemmed from there you know mm. so i'm saying chinita itself has like it's, it's like the fit. perfect name for you know it's literally means chinese girl if she was in mexico they would be calling her chinita, chinita. sure yeah. Yeah. yeah i i mean i speak a little bit of spanish and so when i saw the name i was like I know what that means but is, did they know what it means yeah. or like did they choose that name so the funny part is when we have when we when we used to be at the restaurants all the time in the beginning yeah, we the used to have Mexican year. customers come in and they found it hilarious they were like why is your you know a restaurant called uh, and maybe if she wasn't around I had to actually explain that my partner is Malaysian and you know this is what they used to call her in in, in New York yeah. yeah that's so funny yeah. slightly racist but. yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah but it doesn't seem that way over here you know that's why yeah. it works if, yeah. it, if I was in America then this would be like no this is a you get cancelled yeah exactly yeah, absolutely <laughs> but it's it's perfect for you know for you yeah, absolutely yeah, for definitely yeah. so 2011 then, is when you guys are doing this soul sante you're going to flea markets yeah. you start the catering business how how different like i guess it actually starts to become a business at that point right where you're catering and you're putting on like, you're putting quite a bit of time into this um how is the business doing financially if you had to go back in time and remember what the balance sheet looked like back then <laughs> no no of course absolutely um but i will clarify that soul sante when they did the first soul sante they we became a soul sante brand for a while like we didn't do anything else we yeah. were literally just doing other things and then every 3 months we would come together again go and do a stall and then the popularity started to rise from there people would start asking us saying that you know are you opening a restaurant or you know i want i, I um, actually even before that was i'm having like 15 people over and tiny 10 people 12 people 15 people can you guys come and do these tacos at my house then she actually came up with this little it was printed out on an inkjet printer and it was like maybe 10 dishes that don't most of them don't exist on today's menu because it was just like a mexican baked rice and things like that that we put together to hand out to people at soul sante and that's how catering was actually oh, yeah. born oh yeah. it was empanadas too i forgot empanadas about that. yeah oh, things empanadas. that we yeah. So yeah, 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 totally forgotten about that. Wow, yeah. okay. That's what I'm saying there's a lot of pieces that you yeah, know yeah. that Okay, okay, that, good, uh, good. Good that you remember. Yeah. This. So <laughs> then we uh, started getting a lot of requests for catering, then we started catering at that time. The financials like I mean literally for a brand that was only doing taco stalls and you know we might be we potentially we're probably getting like an order a week if that some weeks they may have been nothing. 12 people multiplied by 600 means, you know, this was not enough to like yeah. for anyone to make a livelihood off. it was more just time spent building uh sort of doing market validation building the brand up building brand awareness mainly you know without much return at all like till we actually started doing catering more regularly and became bigger yeah. which is when we took that room and you know that she was talking about the room at the back of my parents house yeah then it started to get a little bit more serious yeah because then we had a full time employee but there's one very important uh, detail that happened which was uh, uh an event that allowed us to even catapult the business further which was uh there's a bar called Humming Tree was it an, you don't I've probably been there I don't okay know. so it was basically a friend of mine called Nikhil uh so he uh very passionate about music and he was all about the artists and he wanted to give them like the ultimate venue in India to come and perform and uh so but his interest was mostly in the music aspect of it he didn't want anything to do with food and So he brought us in and another experienced restauranter who was running a restaurant for many years in Bangalore. So that was the biggest learning to actually understand the business and you know and that's so now we started we were able to launch our tacos as as part of his regular menu. Oh, wow. Like so it actually had chinita burritos tacos, too. Burritos, tacos, yeah. uh chips and salsa. It was very limited menu, but we had a chinita menu at his place for about a year. Wow. So that is when we actually hired our first guy, converted the back room into like a semi by meaning like a home carpenter coming in and building shelves and putting a stainless steel like table like literally using like a home oven with like you know it was like yeah. a very make do commercial kitchen and tiny i mean we're talking like maybe 4 feet by like 6 feet or 7 feet you know so we had this regular order coming in from there which made it all worthwhile now and then on top of that we started doing a lot more catering and the parties got much bigger they went up to like 50 people 75 yeah. people but what made it all worthwhile is that this Humming Tree thing gave us an opportunity to get a regular daily order where it made sense to actually hire somebody and and start a small kitchen and then we were running catering simultaneously out of there. Okay. I should yeah. mention that during the catering days um because we only have one guy working for us, 
we would actually go oh, yeah. to the catering. And it's interesting because uh, we would do the setup and we would be the one who is assembling and serving the uh, the customers. Yeah. I mean, not the, the, pe- the people at the party. Yeah. And, and because people are usually quite shocked to see us yeah. serving the food, we at the end of the party get invited to be in the party so we get we will seated and then we'll sing with them we'll drink with them we yeah. eat with them so it was kind of fun we actually like we get invited to parties and we get paid no and yeah. also many of them were through like I mean like any business it yeah. goes through your network right like it's word of mouth someone at a party tried it they know that you're friends with the previous person who you catered for so then it was like oh no why are you like standing behind the counter just come and have a glass of wine with us you know yeah. that like no no I'm working Then, but inevitably at the end of the party it would be now sit down, yeah. have a beer with us, you know, like, let's just relax, you know, because we'll obviously be there till the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know at this point in the journey, right, 2012 to 2013 time frame, like, did you, were you feeling excited by the sort of word of mouth organic growth that your brand was seeing? I, okay, so 2012 was when my first born happened. So uh, I was excited for both. I was excited for the business uh, being where it is but to me it was still kind of like uh, you know it's unreal like, this is kind of fun this is cool but like I'm not sure if this is going to last or not it is a good uh, income uh, but I wasn't sure where it was going and so um, it's like so I, I was just kind of going with the flow whenever we get like uh, an order for catering I'm more than happy to do it but uh, but there was no question from me at least like where can I push this further and that's more for him. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm like you're kind of doing this catering thing, which isn't, you know, you're there at the at the venue, right? Yeah. And and it's not really scalable. Yeah. Uh, although very fun, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. getting to hang out with people, I'm yeah. sure was a blast. Um, also doing still flea markets at this point, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, when did the conversation turn to, hey, maybe we should actually do what people have been telling us to do for years, which is set up a restaurant? So we actually formed our firm like our our official partnership was in 2013 when we all decided that hey this is something that has a lot of potential let's get together and turn this into a real business and turn it into something the big catalyst that came was with humming tree the amount of time that we were spending at humming tree like just because it was you know uh, that kitchen was running at home but i would spend most of my days at from morning to evening at humming tree like helping him run the humming tree And so I saw the setup of that, and so did she. I mean, she also spent a lot of time there, where we started to see an experienced restauranter coming in, meaning the other food partner that they had, who uh, we were able to see hiring, setting up of a commercial kitchen, setting up technology systems, uh, hiring like front-end staff, training front-end staff, getting the whole like machine going. And that, I think, gave us, at least from my perspective, that gave me the confidence to say that, hey, listen, this is like the best learning that, I mean, you couldn't pay for this in like an MBA, you know, being able to see this firsthand, uh, the whole process of actually setting up a restaurant without us having to, you know, sort of invest or, you know, take any risk at all. 2014 was when we opened the first restaurant. So we did Humming Tree for about a year. And yeah. 2014 was when we actually said that, hey, this is a real business. Let's take the leap of faith and open our first restaurant. Incredible. Yeah. That's actually, yeah, that's amazing that you were able to shadow yeah. what they were doing for a year before deciding, okay, now let's do it ourselves. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. It was was, a, tell me about the experience of setting up that first location in Indranagar. Was mm-hmm. it was it challenging? I'm guessing first time. Mm-hmm. I'm, now you know you're you guys have set up a, yeah. another location in, in uh, Koramangala, then Whitefield, um, but at but at that stage, <laughs> it was, was it a hectic journey? <laughs> um, I think there were a lot a lot of things to learn. I mean, just looking for a location was tough, right? Because this is a, a self funded company, right? A self funded restaurant. Now. But I should say that like I just wanted a little hole in a wall with some stool outside. Actually, if I like rewind a little bit, I just wanted a truck. <laughs> I just go, I was like, I just want a taco truck, park me anywhere. And it was I'll practically it. like a truck what we had. Yeah. It was like a real yeah. unique space that we took. But, Correct. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, talk except about it. it's like on top. So, um, yeah. so when we found, when we saw this space and we saw a lot of spaces and this, when we saw this space, I was like, it's cool. You know, it, it's, it's like an abandoned building, but it's not. It's this very old uh, house that's converted into um, a restaurant before, and then um, then we took it over. But it was big enough that I feel like you know this is 
so this would work as a first uh, try, uh, first restaurant at least. I mean, I didn't even think any further than that, but this is this works for me because I want it small. And um, but yeah, like uh, it, it was challenging, I think, for them too because uh, uh, he he's always kind of spearheaded the business part, the operations, and everything. I think like for me, I just wanted to make sure that the kitchen works for me and the front, um, you know, serving area, and it has to look cool. That's that yeah. was my my. Uh, a requirement. So just to add to what she's saying, that that was the number one uh, objective was to set up a place which was inspired by some of these ultra cool San Francisco, New York places, which are like literally the sign is like this small, so you can't even read. It was always meant to be that the coolness was supposed to come from that, you know. So we we took this place above a tire shop, right? It was the whole building was a restaurant before, but then post that they got a, a tenant that's a tire shop on the ground floor. The first floor was about maybe twenty five hundred square feet. We actually negotiated with the landlord to cut the space in half, that we will segregate it. We'll put up the walls and everything. Just we only want 50 percent of the floor. And again, these were all baby steps. In hindsight, like if you ask me later about what we could have done better, I'll, I'll answer that, too. But we took about 1300 square feet at a minimal rent. I mean, because it was it was an offbeat location. It was not prime Indranagar by any means. So it was a huge risk from that standpoint. And uh, but we got the coolness out of it because it literally was like this raw canvas where we had to go in and yeah. think about every little detail, even to the point where because it was an older building, like it had a little bit of structural, like, you know, sort of yeah. um, uh, like a, maybe a couple of cracks or something that we had to reinforce. Yeah. So we had to get a structural engineer in there and say that, OK, you need to support metal. You know, you need to put in like metal beams here and that'll solve the problem. Right. So. But was, like, we, so, had to, but, we had to think of the design yeah. aspect of the metal beams. Like, okay, fine. What pattern should we put it in? Like, okay, let's put... Yeah. So there was so much like love and attention to detail that went into that first outlet. And of course, as you open more, yeah. that does tend to become a little bit more formula driven. But the first one really had like the heart and soul in it, yeah. you know? So as you mentioned yeah. to the Amit... Um, he because he's a designer uh, and after we sit down and we talked about how we wanted this space to look like um, we wanted it to be raw we wanted it to be stylish but not like extravagant we wanted it to be like cool like as if you would you could be in New York or San Francisco but you could also be in Mexico City and um, and and you can tell that you are sitting in a cool Mexican restaurant and which is why I think it, w- it was important to us that Food is one thing, but like entering Chinita and sitting down and having your meal, you should feel like you're somewhere else, right? You, uh, It's part of the package. It's part of the experience. Well, I think you guys have been successful on that front, at least from my <laughs> you know, multiple experiences with the brand. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So setting up, this is like a business podcast, obviously, right? Yeah. Um, financially, I think renting a space is not difficult. Maybe even putting the security deposit is within reach. But yeah. what you're describing is also reinforcing. You know, you've got to set up all the kitchen stuff in the back. So you, that's that's yeah. really expensive stuff, right? Yeah. Were you able to take whatever profits you had already generated from the catering and the flea market side of the business and just cover all those expenses? Or were there some additional expenses that needed to come from somewhere else? And if so, uh, where did that money come from? So I would say the catering part of it was still like, I mean... We were doing reasonably well, but compared to actually setting up restaurants and, you know, running a full-fledged operation, it doesn't even compare in terms of top line. It was profitable from the standpoint that catering itself is a fantastic business to run because you have no, the investment cost is very low. You only buy inventory when you have orders, right? So if you don't have orders, there's there's no, everything is against, then 50% advance takes care of your cost right there. The remaining 50% you get paid later is the actual profit. Mark, I, marketing is zero. Marketing is word of mouth. We did everything word of mouth for too many years, I would say. Like, I mean, even post opening the restaurants, which was a, in hindsight, I would have done that differently. But uh, there was nothing left over to open the restaurants for sure. I mean, because whatever we were getting was just about enough to, you know, sort of take care of some income for, for us, you know, and uh, and it wasn't much. Like, because the scale of the business, it seemed like a lot at that time because the numbers that you set yourselves when you're first starting also, like if you say you're doing like 50 lakhs a year, it sounds like a decent number, but it's, I mean, looking back, like obviously it wasn't much at all, you know? And I mean, I would say catering went, high, you know, higher than that, uh, but it's still not enough to, you know, sort of like, it wasn't enough to act for us to actually collect funds to fund anything in the future. So that investment had to come directly from us, the three partners. Whatever savings you guys had. Yeah, it was just savings that we used and said that uh, clearly that, you know, we're just, this is the amount we're going to invest. And, you know, we, I mean, we did that. Yeah. 
and you're off to the races. You've got this first location set up, 2014. Yeah. <laughs> people start coming in, yeah. right? A lot of people that know about the brand, right, who love the brand already. So you guys have a head start over a restaurant that just, you know, someone snaps their fingers and starts a brand, right? Like yeah. no one knows about it. And it takes about a year to like get started. Yeah. Uh, what was it like in terms of footfall, in terms of uh, the customer experience, what were people telling you guys? I don't know, I'm answering this one because <laughs> I'm sure that there's a certain aspect of it which is not gonna be told. Oh, can I say no. something first? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm always very proud of this, okay? Because uh, for the first three months, as I mean, even further along after that, um, I think the weekends were super packed and people used to line up uh, from where, you know, it, the Indranagar location is on the first floor. So people used to line up from where uh, the entrance is all the way down. Down to, the stairs. Yeah, downstairs to get a table. And we have like maybe like 30 people in line just to get a table. And people used to get so... Well, sometimes more than that. Yeah, and, used to get like, so was... angry with us because they couldn't um, get a table. And, and because we were just starting out, Sam and I were always in the kitchen and always in the um, you know serving people and taking orders and explaining our food and everything because I feel like there there needs to be a little bit of uh, education happening because it's, it's, it's real Mexican food we have to talk about that in a bit yeah. um, so we have to like kind of explain to people how how to eat what what goes with what and the recommendation of what you get that day was very crucial I feel for especially for people who are new to Mexican food um, but uh, but we also opened for lunch and dinner, and we were shut in between. Um, right now, it's different. And we, we were closed on Monday. Yeah, and we were closed yeah. on Monday. Because it was family run. I mean, like, yeah. so owner well, run, I mean, right? Yeah, we couldn't yeah. push ourselves that crazy. So we had to shut after 3.30. And then and I think um, after a certain time, we have to tell people, like, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. And then they get really, really angry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so, you yeah, what I was going to remind her of, which I'm sure she's forgotten, was basically... We opened in April 2014 by putting up, you know, our own funds and everything and spent money. And like you said, there was additional cost. We had to build a staircase from scratch to get up to the restaurant. We had to put in metal beams. Our door was like, you know, again, these MS, you know, sort of massive pieces that we needed for like structure as well as for style. So these things added a lot of cost that, you know, we didn't. But having said that, we didn't really invest like any crazy. It wasn't looking back. It wasn't like a crazy amount that we did invest. Yeah, but it wasn't like a decent amount. What are, are you like? Can you tell me like ballpark? Yeah, yeah it was 30, <laughs> 30 lakhs is what we put into the first, uh, the initial uh, uh, round of just taking half that floor. In the future, we took over the whole floor, by the way. But yeah, oh. I'll tell you that first two months were extremely slow because we opened in front of uh, on top of this tire shop. May and June of that year, like I mean, we had like Friday nights. I remember like one Friday night I was there, and the only two people who showed up was like a couple friend who and again you feel almost like sorry that you know they they see your place like that you know i don't remember and this at yeah, all. yeah it was empty the first two months <laughs> i i know the figures like i remember how much sale we did in those two months also i remember crowd. And, and it turned into like so there was like so uh just one lesson here just from business in general like it sounds uh like a glorious you know sort of story that hey we raise brand awareness and we you know sort of did but at the end of the day the market that you're dealing with is much much larger than that your friends, family, their extended networks is only a piece of getting you started. It's like literally just the initial boost. It cannot keep a restaurant like full uh, every meal of every day. That you have to start actually working on your own like merit to, you know, start building from pretty much like what it would have given us was the 10% or 15% push that we needed to get started. It doesn't allow you to open a restaurant and do well just because we spent that time. The two years we spent building up the brand would have helped, but not that much is what I mean, you know? Sure. Yeah, not so, as much as people would think is what it, sorry, that's the right way to put it. What, account, and, what accounts for sort of the difference between, as you said, the first two months where yeah. people just really didn't know, right? And you're, yeah, was, you're not spending money on marketing, right? Zero, so zero marketing, you can't like expect, not a rupee, yeah. Yeah, to eventually getting to the point that you're remembering, yeah. right? Which is, you know, also a, a real memory, right? Yeah. It's a real thing that happened, yeah. but it's just maybe it happened a little bit later on. Yeah. How did How did that journey play out? How did that happen? So there's a, again, there's a, in June, on June 16th, we opened on April 25th. On June 16th, or oh, sorry, I think it was July 16th, there was a fire in the restaurant that burnt the whole restaurant down. Yeah. Yeah. So it basically was a stabilizer that basically sparked in the middle of the night. Uh, there was probably a plastic, like, you know, bench or something, maybe a little bit away from it, but the plastic bench caught fire. And at no, six was, in the morning... It, it caught the RO... Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah. like, a ton of stuff burned down. Yeah. And this happened, like, two and a half months after we opened. And by this time, we had no traction. Like, the numbers were still, like, 
even in terms of like the number of people we were serving a month would have been like 600 500 to 600 customers a month i'm talking about the whole month so that's what some restaurants do in like a day right yeah, yeah yeah of course absolutely so uh and then I, i again now speaking from my perspective this did turn into like a source of like stress you know like stress meaning like you're sort of like wondering you know we made this investment like what have we done you know was this a the right thing to do because everyone told yeah. you to open a restaurant yeah exactly and you love the food everyone loves the food and you yeah. and you're thinking this is the next natural step but yeah. then you open it up and and it's like well you're in a crowded <laughs> market right yeah. there's a lot of restaurants in indranagar like yeah. you're yeah. competing so yeah. there were two events that you know were larger than you know when you look back it's like you know maybe the universe had play or whatever right mm. one was this fire which at 6 in the morning one of my employees showed up at at our door and rang the bell covered in like suit and he's like i've just come from the restaurant everything is like burnt down immediately i went and i think they came like i heard and amit came like maybe half an hour or one hour later and like it was the most like it you felt the mood was like basically like how you you know when someone dies it's it felt exactly like that like that was the exact atmosphere that was in the air like how you feel at a funeral it was exactly like that but we the whole team scrambled we only had like six or seven employees at that time the whole team came together like you couldn't imagine they literally uh, i mean this person who's who was also our first employee who showed up at our door he scrambled all the troops everybody came including us sitting there and scrubbing suit off like everything whatever we couldn't salvage we had to throw our contractor who had done the restaurant came in and he was also like i mean uh, just unbelievable that he did this he came in free of cost and said that you know i'm not like this should never have happened it wasn't his fault i mean just clarifying that it was just a stabilizer that malfunctioned right it had nothing to do with him but he took responsibility to kind of repaint the restaurant have his staff work in 48 hours they rebuilt the whole restaurant for us what and we got new fridges in we got everything in and we had a new restaurant again uh in 48 hours right and that at least for me was my like saying that hey this is not a source of like you know something that should be causing you anguish this is like a rebirth that we've had let's fresh approach newborn you know like let's let's see what we can do from here you know it was like a completely new like as if we've been presented yeah. with a new restaurant it also makes you realize what you actually lost because you're looking at things from the perspective of what do i not have oh i don't have customers i don't have this suddenly we started to appreciate what we did have and then post that it was like okay i have this beautiful restaurant now let me see what i can do with it we started the whole approach changed from what was lacking to what we have you started to feel appreciation for for what you actually had right Tinita obviously didn't anticipate that fire breaking out, but they were financially stable enough to cover the cost of that unexpected expense. And as a profitable bootstrapped company, they've been very careful to maintain tight control over things like the price of ingredients and the cost of salaries and rent and utilities. And if you're a restaurant owner and you're not doing these things, if you're not keeping a close eye on your P&L and something like this happens unexpectedly, then you're toast. Luckily though, this video sponsor Explorex is here to help. Their operating system for restaurants Restaurants called Bridge puts you as a restaurant owner in God mode. Using their platform, you can see every financial metric of your business, which items are selling and which ones aren't. And their platform even offers suggestions on things that you can do to increase your bottom line efficiency while also improving your top line. For example, let's say that there's a dish that just isn't selling well, but the ingredients for that dish actually cost a lot and it's positioned higher up on your menu. Well, Bridge would advise you to move that item down so that it's less prominent and people order it less, and to fill that gap in the menu with a more profitable item that people order more frequently. And in the background, Bridge. is also going to order inventory items for that de-emphasized menu item less so that you can mitigate ingredient wastage too. And this is really just scratching the surface here. Explorex offers a full suite of tools like POS, reservation management, billing, payments, and much, much more in a single package. And so, if you're not already using Bridge for your restaurant business, then you're leaving money on the table and you're probably missing out on providing your patrons with a superior customer experience. So, if you're interested in learning more about Explorex and their operating system for restaurants, Bridge, then click on the link in the description. Description down below. And now on with the podcast. So one more thing that happened was there was some blog which, like, literally I've never even heard of till today. I can't even remember the name, but they published a list of the top, hottest new like six or seven restaurants in Bangalore. And like Fatty Bao was on that list, Chinita was on that list, and that blog went viral. I think it was called like Polka something. It was just a blog that someone wrote, like literally, and really? it was a blog that wasn't well known. It's not like you know, okay, Time Out wrote it or you know whoever. It was. just some arbitrary blog that i had never heard of before published this list from there this post went viral everyone in bangalore had read it and suddenly that was our push to 
start like our word of mouth was taken care of. i mean sorry our marketing was taken care of because of that article from there the sales just literally went like it was one month here next month 30% higher 25% higher 30% higher 20% higher and this went on for about maybe 12 months after that like literally we were seeing that kind of growth 30% a month how much of it do you think was that blog was it just people like reading the blog and just being like oh yeah, yeah like i got to check this place out it put every it put us on everybody's radar wow and like i don't know how it happened like it was just looking back it was because it it was obscure and it went viral for whatever reason and we were on that list as one of the hottest new places to check out in bangalore so this fire and that blog basically helped to push the restaurant along then they got to experience what we actually had which was and that was what we knew we had we had impeccable service run by us the kitchen was being monitored by her the experience that customers got when they got our whole thing for the first like few years was that when customers come here they need to say wow like literally they need to be walking out of this place saying that wow that was incredible well that was the experience for me because you guys yeah. have and, and this is actually something i realized later on that ingredients are made fresh yeah. like uh, it's all handmade right it's like completely authentic food and it's not like uh not to bash tex-mex but like it's not sort of an american iced version of mexican food it's actually authentic which mexican the, food which i think is where where you come from. you come in right like yeah. this is actually something that you were really passionate about yeah so when we decided to use chinita as the name uh, and it's so obscure no one's going to understand what the heck was so we had to kind of call it something else we needed like a, a tagline and so the tagline was real mexican food yeah and um and because we didn't want to be associated with uh, tex-mex because we are not tex-mex we are mexican food like food that, like mexican food that you would eat if you go to mexico or to california or texas but it's a difficult thing to do because i think there's a lot of education that needs to happen right especially with sort of the taco bells of the world Correct. sort of dominating the space and making people think oh that's what mexican food is yeah. right and then they come to Chini chinita expecting the same thing but just like maybe a better version like a gourmet version of taco bell yeah. and they sit down and they're like wait i don't know what any of these things are on the menu <laughs> right yeah. so how did you guys go about actually educating your customers well so we we spoke a lot like when he said that we spoke to every customer who came in we we spoke to every customer not who came just in. spoke to customers we, we were the ones taking their orders yeah, we, were, we taking, were the waiters yes. taking orders like we were for the everybody. servers yeah. yes so we would sit them so um when i was in uh, maybe the first two or three years um uh, after post college uh, i was working in new york i was always with like tech startups so in between jobs or whatever i used to work in restaurants so um as a waitress So that's where I picked up a lot of like these soft skills and you know and I know what makes people happy I know what to say and how to upsell blah 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 that kind of stuff. And um so when customers come in and this is how I train the service till date and we have now three locations they are they have a script they have to instead of saying like good morning ma'am or good morning sir they have to say welcome to Chinita because that works and 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 it's simple and it's like genderless it's uh, you can say it in the morning in the evening whenever right so those those kind of things so during that first couple of years um when we were trying to educate customers we would you know make sure that they're comfortable they sit down and then we would talk to them we will try to gauge them and see how what kind of food they were like are they like the roti type of person or are they like rice person and like how how hungry are you or like yeah. do you like spicy not spicy and how adventurous are you with food and then we started using words like um what's the word i can't remember <laughs> so like like so there's a few things that people will ask like what's your specialty what's your special for the day right yeah. and um we don't have any specials for the day but we have a lot of very popular items today but which we didn't know back then uh but like say for for example horchata is on horchata is basically made out of rice it's rice milk but there's no milk in it so when a lot of people get confused and now it's more uh popular that people is like oh yeah okay we get vegan milk but back then um uh, 9 years ago right there was no non dairy milk so to say like this is rice milk and also has almond milk in it it's very hard for people to understand so there's a lot of explanation that has to happen plant based or like um and then uh people will say like uh you know I want I want a, a taco but how why is your taco not 
U-shaped. Yeah. And why is, why is it, it not, not crispy? Yeah, yeah, why is it not crispy? So then again, it's like, you know, this is how you eat, how, how tacos are meant to be eaten. And then, you know, this is corn tortillas. It's supposed to be soft. And like, if you want crispy tortillas, we have it in a tostada style. So there's a lot of explanation and you just have to be, oh, I, we were very patient. And, and I love that. I love to educate people as long as they understand and they uh, experience it like they were open to the experience of eating something the way it's meant to be eaten and uh, enjoyed it um, I think I our job was done so I'm going to fast forward a little bit here looking at 2018 I guess at that point things are going well enough at this Indranagar location that you're thinking hey maybe we should look at expanding right yeah. Um, so what was the journey of moving uh, or setting up your second location in Koramangla? And are there in, any interesting stories there? So we chose Koramangla as the second location. Uh, I mean, I'm just covering all aspects of it. It was the second hottest market at that time in Bangalore. But it just so happened that I, they had started a lot of construction work in Koramangla a few months before that. So um, and generally what was also happening in Koramangla at that time was that... Uh, the other surrounding, like HSR and uh, BTM and all these places, Sarjapur Road, were starting to become independently, you know, sort of uh, self-sufficient with their own, like, bars and restaurants. Koramangla was a hub for South Bangalore in, like, 2014, 15, 13, 16. By 2017, with this cons- because of the road work that was happening, it kind of started to keep people away from there a little bit. So that was a big challenge when we did open. It was a much bigger space than what we took in Indranagar from the standpoint of it was like an open floor, like a typical commercial building. So we had to kind of work with a much larger, like open space to, you know, sort of from a design standpoint, from a customer experience standpoint, I'd say the biggest challenge was the vibe that we created in Ranagar with, yeah. because it had these different rooms and, there was, you know, it's open air. Yeah, it's yeah it, open it was air. open. So we had to create the same atmosphere, which was the biggest challenge to say that, hey, I walked into a Chinita, right? So, I mean, till from at least a year or two after that, Mm. People would walk into Koramangla and say that, oh, no, I like the atmosphere of the Indranagar one, you know, just because they have that associated, the flagship, you know, that's the vibe that they walked into. Maybe when they came, there was a personal, you know, sort of association that they make with the feeling that they had, you know. So that was the biggest challenge, replicating this in a much more open, larger space because it didn't have the same setup. Uh, So I'd say that was the biggest like challenge in terms of actually setting it up. It was a much higher investment uh, outlet. And I think and, uh, we we were kind of hoping that um, it would pick up because Koramangla, we were expecting... Uh, it, it, I mean, first of all, at this point, right before Koramangla opened, that is that line that I was telling you about earlier, that started happening a lot in Indranaga. So we we were hoping that, you know, opening Koramangla, and it did, helped a lot. Like a lot of our customers from Indranaga started going to Koramangla, which, uh, you know, released a lot of the load on Indranaga. And in Koramangla, for me from the kitchen and operation point of view, it was awesome because it was new, it was spacious, and I could just, it, it's, a, it's a new playground, right? So, um, so it was awesome. And, and But I think the challenge was also like trying to get people to come in. Like he said, there was it, it was lacking that special vibe that created um, in that we created in Indranaga. And also I think it was a slightly different market because they were more yeah, student-centric. Maybe. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, less uh, people who eat it out. I don't know at that point. No, yeah, that area is, uh, I feel like, a little bit younger. Yeah. I used to live yeah. in 8th block. So I my first Chinita experience was in that Kormangla. Yeah. But I mean, for me, I, because I didn't have anything to compare it to, I'd never been yeah. to the Indranagar location. I was like, this is super cool. I, yeah. I love this place. Yeah. Thank um, you. But I can totally understand now that I've been to Indranagar that it's very much, it, it feels less uh, sort of organic. It feels, yeah. you know, like you said, more of a commercial space. Yeah. Another and, challenge that was happening was um, uh, the way we ran Indranagar was very hands-on, right? Um, as problem comes, we fix them. So there was no particular systems or operations. So when uh, when Koramangla opened, um, similar problems would happen. And so it was also, it was very hard. It was difficult to try to fix problems that was happening in in Ranaga as well as happening in in Koramangla. How are you guys distributing yourselves, right? Is it basically like one person on any given day is in Koramangla and the other one is in in Ranaga and you're switching back and forth? No, we we do roles that are not dependent on, like it doesn't, not that way. Like I have a schedule independent of the way that she is because the roles are also very clear. 
So yeah, what but she goes now, now I think now the roles are very clear. I think in the past, even when we had the two um, locations, it was still kind of like we were kind of overlapping a little bit because I think staff know the staff knows that okay, these are the two founders, and um, okay, we should listen to this person, and but so this person will tell us this, and so he would say some stuff in the kitchen if I'm not around, or like if I would tell the people in the front, that kind of stuff. So, but um, but there were not much. Um, s- structure to a- anything. SOPs, yeah. Yeah, there was no SOPs yeah, exactly. Zero. Zero. Um, when even when we have the second location, so it was really tough because in my head it's it's almost like a ginormous volcano that was about to explode. Because, like I said, you you just kind of fix things by patching it up. It was never really. Um, a permanent fix. So how do you go from that state where you guys are sort of actively firefighting as founders yeah. and and you're the sort of point of contact yeah. for everyone? How do you how do you transition that and how do you build those SOPs and when did you start thinking about that? Was it like before the pandemic and you were able to sort things out by the time the pandemic hit or or is it still like an active journey? I would say that no. We, yeah. were, and we were looking for a third location like just before COVID started. We were looking in North Bangalore and nearly finalized the place to uh, then we knew the signs of this was probably like Jan or Feb of 2020. We knew that the COVID was coming and it doesn't make sense to sign something right now. So luckily we didn't end up doing that. Actually, in fact, and we found a place. We were going to sign it. It was like a month. It was a weekend that we saw on BL Road. And yeah, we were that's going the one to I'm talking it, about, right? yeah. And then I think on Wednesday, there was a lockdown. Oh, wow. Yeah, but I mean, the yeah. signs were already, it was kind of like we were talking to them, but at the same time, oh, you know, I yeah. don't know, like, let's just see, keep it going. Let's see what happens, you know. But then it started to become clear that things were going to go downhill, you know. The, the, pa- the pandemic hits. Um, and you were mentioning, too, that you didn't really have, mar- you didn't know how to do marketing really well, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think you were largely reliant upon uh, people who are coming to your offline brick and mortar locations. Yeah. Um, did you have delivery set up though? Were you working with these uh, apps, Swiggy and Zomato at that point? And, and how much of your business was uh, coming from those platforms? Okay, so we actually, uh, one thing we did right was in about 2017 or 18, we st- I mean, at least that understand, the realization came that customers are always gonna move towards convenience, right? So if someone has to go to a store and buy something, uh, as opposed to sitting at home and ordering on Amazon. Ultimately, that shift is going to keep, every year it's just going to get higher and higher, right? And that was starting to happen for food also. So in 2017 or so, I would say that we started to focus on delivery more, where we were like, you know, without compromising on dine-in, we don't want to lose dine-in customers to delivery, but there's going to be this whole new segment coming up in the delivery market. So we actually spend a lot of time uh, on packaging, uh, making sure the food travels well, um, you know, all these typical exercises to make sure that we were running a solid delivery business as well. And delivery was actually going reasonably well, nothing compared to what it is today because the market wasn't that big then. So obviously just the pandemic was a huge uh, 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 catalyst to help make delivery a much higher business than what it is today, For not just for us, for, for a lot of people. So uh, we also launched Candice's Sandwiches in 2000. Yeah, I 19, wanted to mention that a, because... Which was a delivery-focused brand. It's actually yeah. like there's no physical... You can't go to Candice's Gourmet Sandwiches and sit down and have a sandwich. Yeah. Although you can go to Chinita and the sandwiches are being made in the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's actually really interesting because this is sort of before that big cloud kitchen wave where that became a word that everyone was familiar with, right? Yeah. 2018, 2019, no one had really... No one was really doing that. Was there anywhere that you looked where you, you took inspiration for that model? Um, and so, just how did you know that that would be? <laughs> I'm gonna so tell, oh, the, so uh, I, he's gonna tell you about the model of but how I, we came up with Candice's also. Yeah, but yeah. I'll tell you how the food came up. With. Yeah, 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 right. So, so the so in Chinita, um, I think maybe like nine months or a year before um, Candice's Gourmet was launched um, in Mexico, there's this bread, uh, this sandwich called pambazos. Okay, and basically what it is, it's just like a, a loaf of like kind of like what, how we serve our sandwiches today. And it's dipped in salsa and it's stuffed with, you know, lettuce, chicken, whatever. And the um, the salsa is then kind of grilled or fried. Sounds and it, delicious. It it's is delicious. Amazing. Yeah. It, was, it was a huge hit in Chinita. Yeah. So I think that's when we knew that, you know what, there's a market for sandwiches. So then... So I was going to say that, yeah, that happened like in... 
uh, maybe the end of 2017, we put pambazos on a special menu. Yeah. And what we realized is that, yeah, it was super popular and people loved the sandwiches. And then we had the, but it was just planting a seed, which never really got, it, we never even spoke saying that, oh, let's look at doing sandwiches or whatever. I'd say about a year later, no, maybe, yeah, about a year later, maybe towards the end of 2018, I had gone on a, a, rec- a, a trip to Hyderabad just for a day to go and see the market and go and check out the neighborhoods and for us to potentially see if there's a market for us to open a chinita there. And the next day turned, so I had only gone for one night. The next morning, there was some unannounced bun that happened. So the city was on standstill. All the commercial places were shut, the malls were closed. And I was sitting by the pool the next morning because there was nothing else to do. And suddenly it occurred to me that, hey, listen, you know, sandwiches, just like Mexican food, there was a gap in the market. We we loved it from the time we were in the US. No one's doing it really well here yet, you know, so. Right. Uh, just like Taco Bell was there, but like yeah. that's not real Mexican food. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with sandwiches. Like, yeah, there's Subway, but yeah. like that's not, I mean, that's Matt sort of Matt. It's a, it's a different uh, yeah. target audience or customer right yeah. uh, whereas you guys are going after people who actually want a good sandwich yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so i came back to bangalore yeah. and basically met with amit and candace and told them that hey listen this is like a you know i remember i still have like sheets of us like or maybe notes on my computer of different names that we could potentially call the brand and you know like what it's going to do potential but that's where she excels when i came back and said that hey listen let's look at doing a sandwich brand right that's all I need to tell her. And she basically gets to work and, you know, like it's literally... But it was easy for me because yeah. I used to live in New York. Okay, I used to live in the corner in New York City. I used to live in the corner of Little Italy and Chinatown. And in the building that was maybe like 200 years old in a tenement apartment uh, where the bathtub is in the kitchen. And at the, in the same building and the uh, ground floor is this like really old Italian deli. So... So that's where I used to get my meats and my breads. And right next to it is this hole in the wall. When you walk in this shop, it's actually a place that sells jade. And then if you go in a little bit in deeper in, it's actually the best banh mis that you can get. So I used to, before I go to work, I would go there, pick it up. And so when he told me, like, let's pick sandwiches, I was like, awesome, because I'm <laughs> going to be recreating everything that I used to eat in New York. So yeah. that was where the banh mis came in. And then if you go like a little bit north to Prince Street, um, there is like a, a place called Havana, which sells the best Cuban sandwiches. And so that was like, yeah, Cuban sandwiches, no brainer. And so, and that's how it goes, you know, like every single sandwich was like something that reminiscent some of a, of a sandwich that I used to eat. Really. I love that. And I love the <laughs> fact that, yeah, the food is authentic. The interactions that you guys are having in your restaurants are also authentic and yeah. you guys are the founders explaining the food to people, educating them. Uh, when the pandemic hits, mm, all yeah. of that goes away. Yeah. Suddenly, you are just another brand competing yeah. for people's eyeballs on a phone screen. Yeah. How did that, like, how did you guys tackle that? And and did you come up with a strategy or were you able to kind of get together, put your heads together and say, okay, like, this is how we don't die. So <laughs> what I actually did before coming was I... I reviewed like our metrics and numbers at the time that COVID started just to clearly remember what happened like at that time and the first like week or two when the lockdowns got announced were we were just swimming without like a rudder right no one knew what was going to happen I don't think it was ever a case that we were going to die that was never it was just more that what do we need to scale back so that we can make it through this period and then reopen you know what we did try to do things that we don't compromise on like over the years was we never let go of a single person we paid full salaries to everybody because and people left themselves just because they got scared, like their families were calling them back to wherever they were from. But from our standpoint, our mandate was that we are not going to let anybody go and they will get paid. So uh, those are just things that we do over the years that I mean, it just goes a long way. And like the people who work for us have that uh, impression about our, and the culture gets built right as you get bigger then the word spreads that this company treats employees this way, right? So, I mean, it, it we really do do that. Like, we live by that. You know, that's one of the main, like... Um, so anyway, like I said, for the first two weeks in COVID, we absolutely aimless. By the third week, because we had invested already in delivery uh, before, as opposed to a lot of other restaurants that started to build up delivery operations during COVID, there were just a handful of places in Bangalore where people had the impression that, hey, I've already been ordering from here. I know they are very hygienic. And people started to associate price point with hygiene. So if you were slightly more expensive, which means that before the pandemic, delivery numbers in the highest volumes in restaurants were at 
you know, if someone was priced at 150, 200 rupees a dish, they were doing crazy volumes. And the guy priced at like 300, 350 was generally doing significantly less volumes. Then the dynamic changed. The dynamic changed because people started to associate the fact that, hey, this restaurant is more expensive, which means that they're more hygienic. But it was twofold. One was that aspect of it. But the other aspect of it was very much that we had already done delivery for two years and built up a very strong customer base. So they started to associate the fact that ordering from Chinita is safe. And our numbers came back pretty quickly. In fact, we were doing, uh, within the first like three or four months of the lockdown, or maybe like not even, what am I saying, that everything reopened three or four months later. I'd say within like uh, two months, we were probably doing about 75% of our pre-COVID revenue just through delivery. Oh, wow. Yeah. Whereas previously, before the pandemic, how much of your revenue was coming from offline versus online? I would say before pandemic, it would probably have been about 75, 25 to 70, 30, somewhere in that range. Yeah, Se- including Candace's. 75 would, would have been Diamond. offline. Dining. Yeah, offline. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you guys really did a 180. Yeah, I mean, during COVID, we had no choice. Had I mean, no we, choice. Needed, we needed the delivery. Delivery, I mean, basically, and even more so, like, Swiggy was where the bulk of our business was coming from during 2020. We were literally waiting for Swiggy payouts to come in so we could clear vendors. We could pay salaries, you know? And they were paying, you know, Swiggy works on a either a bi-weekly or a, you know, once a week payment or twice a week you can opt for that literally we were waiting for that day just to get some funds in the account because dine-in was shut off you didn't have that revenue stream coming in at all right so i'd say we were like obviously things were not good like i mean we didn't take a single like our salaries were completely gone there was no question about that we had negotiated rents with landlords um but we also did this thing where we started doing community um yeah uh, deliveries yeah yeah in the later stage so we um and we would do the deliveries and the meals Oh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we had to come up with like, you know, ways to kind of entice people to order from us. Yeah, to like not just rely only on yeah. delivery to like replace the dine-in business somehow, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we, um, for every day of the week, we would choose a neighborhood. So like say on a Friday, we would decide that we'll go to Whitefield. And then we would try to get people from each of those gated communities to kind of form their own little groups and then say like, hey, we're going to deliver on Friday. So put in your orders you know, the day off and the morning off. And yeah. then we would pack everything from uh, Indranaga and uh, and then we yeah. ourselves would drive there and drop it off. Candace's car would get loaded with one going to one location. Yeah. My car would get loaded for the other location. Yeah. And wow. we would go and deliver. And like, yeah. of course, people found it like super weird when we showed up at their door. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, they were waiting with like, you know, the spray and sanitizer <laughs> and, you know, like face shield and all that. But like literally, I mean, seeing like these cars pull up like right outside their house, they were confused, you know, like... <laughs> yeah, like, it, was, it was strange to them, yeah. yeah. Were yeah. you able to use, like, how much of those interactions during the pandemic um, shaped the decision to open your third location in Whitefield? Because that actually happened... You guys opened that location up sort of before the pandemic had fully wound down, I believe, right? Yeah. Or maybe you started looking into that location during the pandemic itself. Um, as opposed to Koromangla in Whitefield, it was a little bit easier, I think, to get people to come in because, um, you know, this this little WhatsApp group that we had formed during pandemic for the yeah, community helped, delivery, yeah. all I had to do was send a message out saying, hey, guys, we're now in Miraya Rose. So I think that first weekend yeah. when uh, when the Whitefield location was open, I think no one had, um, had the idea that it was going to be completely full house. And I think like all, all the all of the foreigner friends and everyone else who yeah. like, who who knew about Chinita came over very excitedly and and you know and people started talking about it like you know friends would tell friends and they have their own little WhatsApp group within their communities and so they started telling everyone else that you know yeah. Chinita is open it's great and you know so excited um, so I think that that helped a lot um, and I think that's why I think Whitefield uh, is has been quite successful from day one. So by 2021, uh, you guys are well on your way as sort of a, a an expanding brand now, I guess you yeah. could say, right? Kormangala, two locations, like, yes, you know, you have two locations, but like, is it going to go to thir- three and, and eventually four? No one really knows. And yeah. even you were talking about how you weren't quite sure, right? It, it, it could go either way. Yeah. Um, did you get a lot of inbound requests though? Because you guys are bootstrapped and yeah. you're profitable. Yeah. Did you ever get requests from uh, investors or uh, franchise fran- uh, prospective franchisees who wanted to maybe open up uh, Chinitas outside of uh, the areas that you guys were looking at? Yeah, I mean, both. Absolutely. So yeah. investors, like 
uh, particularly in that first like two or three years when we were in Ranagar, people would see the line outside and I mean, all the big VC guys, everyone, I mean, it's very interesting because what I also realized being at the restaurant is there's the ecosystem is huge and there's so many interesting people that you meet like that I would meet at the restaurant. But anyway, that's sidetracking a little bit. We had tons of people who would just come in as customers and say that, oh yeah, you know, I'm from, I invest in, you know, companies or I'm like the head of like this huge fund in Bangalore, you know, why don't you speak, come and speak to my guys or, you know, whatever, get a card here and there, like do some networking. I mean, we had tons of offers for investment. We always chose consciously to remain uh, self-funded and bootstrapped. We haven't raised a single rupee from outside. Uh, our approach was always that we want to grow organically. We want to accrue the funds to uh, fund the next one. And uh, uh, profitability has also been like uh, the highest priority from day one. So Indranagar was very, very profitable. Koramangla was the big hit that we had to, you know, sort of realize that, you know, if you're running one highly successful location, doesn't mean you open the second one and you're going to, I mean, that yeah. fantasy may not continue in the second one, which it didn't. It took a while, but Koramangla is doing well now. Uh, but it took a while to get there. So, uh, and we had our challenges. I mean, Koramangla, we actually re- took a loan to open the outlet. Uh, Whitefield was a very, very small loan, which is like pretty much, I mean, now we have practically zero debt. It's like zero in the whole company. And now going forward, our whole mantra is that we just want to like profits accumulate, use that to fund the next restaurant. Any expansion, any infrastructure, expanding our central kitchen, whatever we want to do is going to happen through the business. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. I love that that's the strategy of taking the profits and reinvesting it back into the business. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's what to we've grow. been doing. Yeah. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to tell me about your next location. Uh, I think it's it's not yet open, uh, yeah. and at the time of this podcast going live, it will still not be open. Yeah, uh, but it should be. As far as I know, it'll be opening in this year, twenty twenty three. Tell me a little bit about uh, that spot because it's it's different, it's unique. You guys have never opened a location in this type of venue before. Obviously, Eco World is a very highly in that it's the most sought after property in Bellandur for sure, and the restaurants that are there are doing extremely well. So. And uh, no, luckily, I mean, we had good conversations with them and, you know, obviously, you know, they were interested in having us there. We were keen to be there. It's just that they didn't have space for a while. So then uh, the person I was talking to at Bellandur, he said that we're opening this deck level. Do you want to take a look at it? So why don't we think about doing that, you know, and it's going to be like, and it's beautiful. If you see the deck level, it's basically all the commercial restaurants and shops are on the ground floor. There's a floor right above that, which is basically just like open gardens and stuff. And up until and, now, no one has really been like people off the street like me. I've never been able to go up there because you have to like have a key card and yeah, tap correct. the thing to go through the gate. But now it's actually going to be So open. the gates have been removed and they're obviously working. When I mean, nobody's actually open uh, up there yet. And we'll be open probably hopefully in the next like month or so. I mean, give or take. Fingers so crossed. I think they are going to work very hard to raise awareness that, hey, that level is now open and there's commercial establishments coming there too. It's gone from uh, this whole story that we've just, you you guys have shared with me from just this little flea market, you know, taco stand to catering to setting up one location and then two and then dealing with, oh my gosh, now we have two locations. This is hard, you know, and then three and now eventually four and finally setting up these processes for scale. I mean, it's just amazing to see how it's unfolded so organically and and it truly is like a startup story. I don't know if you guys look at it that way, but for me, that's that's how I see it. I mean, top down, you know, bird's eye perspective. Yeah, Yeah. I see it's definitely a startup story um, only without the external funding and you know yeah. and growing like growing, s- yeah, aggressively growing super Correct. Fast. we've kind yes. of done it slow and steady and yeah. you know done it in a way where profitability was the you know um, uh, the mantra to keep going through the years luckily now i mean you asked a question earlier now we're in a position where when you have three restaurants and two brands running out of each uh, each space to you know also control costs and everything we are now in a position where even the systems that she's talking about that are in place our back end kitchen uh, the central kitchen that we set up, um, everything is now part of the infrastructure that allows us to expand faster. So now I'd say that our foundation and base is very much, much stronger today than it used to be, like even a year or two ago. So um, when we were one location, it was running a restaurant. Uh, and it was very much just like, you know, you see us and we see you and, you know, Candice is Chinita and Samir is Chinita. 
Um, but as we grow bigger and now where we are uh, with the multiple locations, it's no longer us. You know, what you see and how you feel is uh, the staff. So I feel I can't stress enough that the investment that you should put on your staff, your training, your um, your motivation to them, your um, you know you the, how you promote uh, from someone who's just uh, literally someone who just came from the village, uh, and as long as they show you their dedication or their hard work, those people should be supported and should be lifted. Yeah. And um, I, I'm always very proud to say this to people that the first guy that we hired when back in the days where he came and worked out of my uh, mother-in-law's uh, back kitchen. He is still with us today, and in fact, he's like one of our top guys. That was Candice Locke and Samir Mir Chandani, co-founders of Chinita. And that is a wrap on season one of Millionaire Mondays. This was the 10th episode, although we do have one bonus episode going live this coming Monday, which you should definitely tune in for. But for everybody who's watched or listened to this podcast season so far, thank you guys so much, and I will see you in the next one.